Welcome everybody, panel especially. Thank you for your time and, and joining us to talk about pain and not just, you know, bruises. So I'm Domingo moderating the class today and the purpose of the panel is to discuss recover from physical trauma and uh, maintaining or returning to uh, competitive capability in our various fields of combat. Uh, we're just gonna go through first uh, the panel and uh, talk about the traumas we've had. Um, Art, you've been the most recent recipient of a trauma. So uh, what was your major trauma that you just recovered from? Last August, preparing for Crown, I had an armor failure, which resulted in, in a great sword hitting the point of my elbow with no, no padding between my elbow and the uh, elbow cut. This uh, resulted in a serious case of bursitis and nothing detectable on an X-ray. In October, I went to a Great Western War and put my armor on, giving plenty of time for it to heal. And the first time I tried to throw a serious shot, 50% uh, of my triceps tendon separated. I had a surgery in December, and my armor was on again last Sunday for the first time. Your Grace Elspieta? A lot of people on the panel here know, but I was born with a congenital heart defect. Um, and on January 28th of 1986, um, at the age of nine, I received my first pacemaker implant. Um, and since then, I've had numerous replacements. Um, mostly, it's just the actual pacemaker unit itself. Occasionally, um, there have been a replacement of leads or stuff having to do with the actual leads itself. So my, my injury is not necessarily a, an injury. It's a, just how to um, cope with um, the things that just are a fact of life. Um, also, um, I have uh, a psoriatic arthritis, which impacts um, my joints that is, I've grown into. So that's been an additional battle that I've been um, having fun with oh, and learning how to cope with um, over the years that uh, um, was compounded upon by injuries in my youth, um, playing competitive softball, and all the things that we do to ourselves when we're young and stupid um in uh that now once we start getting older start to to yell at us more often um, when we do the things we do edward your grace um i actually have have two different ones and they're separated by by a good decade but in um, the most famous one with me uh, trauma wise is in 1993 i took a real life steel sword in the corner of my right eye and crushed the sinus cavity tore my tear duct cracked my skull from here to here and blinded me permanently. Um, so we're like for about 30 years or so getting in there now. But um, and then the second one was I had a over 180 degree tear in my right shoulder from a pro wrestling injury. I had a finisher where I would lift the guy up over my head and military press him a few times and then slam him to the ground. And one of the times that with a guy finisher we've done multiple times, we were in El Paso and it happened and uh, separated. I separated my shoulder toward the, toward the labrum. And I've been dealing with that. I actually won all three crowns with that tear. So, but uh, finally decided to have surgery for that recently. So I've had, I have recovered from that as well. So I definitely understand the shoulder injuries that some of you have gone through. But those are the probably, those are the most two traumatic that we'll, we'll speak about today. Karen? Yeah, so like others, I have a, a couple different ones that I could talk about. Uh, so the first one that um, was a real eye-opener for me was going through pregnancy and childbirth. So it's like running an endurance race for nine months because you're going through all these metabolic, respiratory, cardiovascular changes, you're going through second puberty with all the hormones and the weight gain and the distribution changes, joint changes, uh, skeletal muscle alignment changes. Um, and then after childbirth, you're dealing with abdominal separation, your organs are rearranging, your pelvic floor is like weak, um, you've got breast swelling, tenderness, all of these things going on. And it's a lot of extreme changes, but it hardly registers with people uh, what that entails for coming back to fighting afterwards, because it's just so common. And the other one that um, I've been dealing with continuously has been vocal cord dysfunction. So for about 10 years, I've been dealing with this. And it's like asthma, but instead of my lungs closing up, it's my throat. And then that brings us to rabbit. All of my issues stem from a single event that was in May of 2007. Uh, I was on my way to an event on my motorcycle. 
and I hit an elk on the highway. Um, so I shattered my right forearm. Uh, my right hand had multiple breaks. My left wrist was broken in one spot. And uh, most significantly, medically, it was my neck was broken in two places. That all required quite a bit of medical intervention, to say the least. Okay. And uh, as for myself, uh, see, back when I was barren, I had a bilateral inguinal hernia that had to get repaired right after Gulf Wars. We discovered it just before Gulf Wars. And I told my doctor, can I go camping in March? And he said, yes. So I went to Gulf Wars and probably exacerbated the situation a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, had a bone spur removed from my left shoulder about 15 years ago. And then uh, past October, I had a full length partial depth tear of the supraspinatus on my left shoulder uh, repaired and was finally cleared last week by my uh, orthopedist. The one thing that uh, we're going to want to discuss here is how to do our best to recover and become competitive again. Everybody on the panel here that has listed their injuries has maintained their competitive edge uh, through various uh, ways. And we want to show to other people that, yes, you can, you will get injured doing this sport eventually one way or the other, but uh, there are smart ways and there are dumb ways to recover and get back into fighting. So I was going to go through the panel uh, as we did before, talking about what we've done to maintain our competitive edge while recovering from these uh, these uh, traumas to the body. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Duke Arthur. First thing is, I explained exactly what it is that I was doing when I damaged myself to my physician. Well, my specialist, actually. I uh, got a second opinion before I allowed any surgery to be done. And uh, did all the PT as it was prescribed. Uh, it could be a pain, not necessarily painful. I mean, you know, it's low intensity exercise, really. But you need to do these things if you're going to become strong from a major trauma. It's funny that you mentioned smart ways and dumb ways. Many years ago, before I was a, a squire, I got a, I managed a compression fracture in my back. I don't talk about it much because it's, you know, 1988, I think. And uh, it still bothers me today because I did exactly the right thing. Rubbed dirt in it and walked it off. Don't do that. See a doctor. Get the imaging, do the PT. They're professionals. They generally know what they're doing. It's the only way to recover. Fair enough. Um, Elspieta, since uh, you have the, the most interesting, uh, non traditional, could you care to talk about that? Since I was born with my condition, um, I pretty much had to learn to just um, make it a part of my life. But I had um, have two parents who are wonderful, um, and my brother, for those of you who don't know, is Duke Edwards. So um, I had uh, parents who um, encouraged me to be active and to play sports. I had a brother who was rough and tumble and threw me around like a wrestling um, uh, WWF uh, person. So. Um, they let me learn to how to cope as I was growing up. Um, the day the challenger blew up was the day that my first pacemaker was uh, implanted. So kind of putting a timeline for a lot of you that are were alive then it's been a long time since I um, I've had this. Um, the only sport that my doctor wouldn't let me play was um, tackle football. That was the only sport he forbid um, to my parents when I was nine years old. They wanted me to be an active kid. My brother was an active kid. They knew I was going to be once I started feeling better. Um, and so uh, as I um, started my, my um, adventure into combat um, two decades ago in the SCA, I gravitated towards rapier um, over the heavy combat because heavy is a little bit more like football. Um, and also I'm a, a much more petite woman. I'm not saying that you can't be a petite woman and fight. Don't, not even saying that at all. Um, but my pacemaker is um, not deep in, in me. And so I would require a lot of more armor. It's just a lot of things that didn't excite me personally about um, 
what it would take to, to, to do heavy combat and, and rapier really still spoke to me a lot. And I love it. The biggest thing about living with my pacemaker is that, uh, and my brother also, I mean, he could speak to this. It's something that our major uh, trauma is something we wake up with every day. Um, it's, it's a fact of our daily life, whether we're in the SCA or not. And so, um, it's that reminder that you just, you know, you do what you do and you push through. And if you want to do something and it's passionate to you, um, there's, there's nothing that can stop you, uh, and you'll find a way. And so that's, that's where I had to go through figuring out what the right armor was, um, for fighting. My, my fighting style reflects, um, my, my, my pacemaker actually. And I know we'll talk about that a little later, I think. Um, it's the biggest challenge I, I have with the pacemaker is that I have to go through replacement surgeries. Um, I have one in about two years uh, upcoming. I had, um, they, they last about six to 10 years. Um, eventually I'll have a lead replacement because the current leads I have are about 20, they're old enough to drink. That's all I know. So it's when I come back from those surgeries where I have to retrain my body. Um, the pacemaker is actually in my, my, fighting sh my fighting arm. It's right there. This current one, actually sticks out the wires you can feel it it's the most uncomfortable thing I have to go through on a daily basis um but um but I think growing up and and being encouraged by my family to just um experience life and do what I want to help me really come learn how to live with a foreign object in my body because that's really what it is um and so uh I will forever um have a road to recovery. I also like Perrin have had a had a son, had a child and I agree with her completely. It is a also a very you know turns you up upside down as a fighter because I'll, you know you go from having your kit well figured out to nothing fits and how do you modify and how do you make it work? It took you 9 months to build that child. You know, it's going to take you at least 9 months to get your body back to some semblance of where it's going to be afterwards. My road to recovery, I guess, with having my child is just being accepting of the fact that things, every time I go out there, it's going to be a little different and being comfortable with that, letting myself be okay with, with how things are and, and working through things. Hey, Duke Edward. I had actually been fighting for about three years before I was hurt and nearly killed. Um, and as a, you know, young young male. I mean, I wasn't even legal to, to drink at the time. Um, you know, my whole thought in life was everything was over and I was told I was never going to get a fight again. I was told I was never going to be able to do a lot of the, the stuff that I had been doing at that point. But um, I also had a really awesome dad that kind of didn't allow me to believe that. Um, and once I was able to take impacts to the skull again, after they had to put it back together, I went back to something he had taught me really young and I started, uh, because one of the big problems is all of a sudden I was, uh, went from being a binocular fighter to a mon monocular fighter. And so depth perception was completely shot. I had to, it took easily a year to recover from just the trauma mentally. Um, PTSD is a thing. And then coming out of that, the, so that was like, a year just for that mentally to get back to it i could i was able to fight six months after but honestly it wasn't going to be doing like steel or heavy fighting at that point um i too went to rapier and i spent most of my well, for the longest time most of my fighting had been rapier um, and that was actually that and boxing were the two things that got me back it allowed me to be able to get my depth perception back it allowed me to learn how to be able to see again uh, in combat sports because combat sports have always been part of me. I mean, um, before I was injured, I was training with the US Olympic team, Taekwondo. I was doing all these, I was wrestling um, for fun, not professionally at that point. Um, so the amateur style, I was doing all these, you know, all these kind of fun things um, that you know, I thought nothing could, could ever hurt me. Right. You know, I didn't need a stinking helmet. Um, and, to be able to mentally come back from that was the hardest part. Um, so I'm a believer that in the science of depth perception is actually based on your brain, not actually in, on anything other than that. It's just math. 
And so I had to retrain my brain to be able to see what was that for the depth of things based on the angles and the shadows and a lot of stuff and how to do the math really quick. So I had to reteach my brain the processing of it. So boxing really helped a lot with that. Um, because once you find a range on something and anybody who's ever, who's fought me over the years, will know once I find my range on you, I don't forget my range. Um, and so it's one of the, the ways I, I taught it, right? Is that it's that jab, it's that, and, and, and I can go on for hours talking about how boxing relates to SEA fighting, but those were the things that I had to get over. I had to get over really though, the mental aspect of it, being afraid of fighting again. Um, that's a real tremendous ordeal when something you love so much and nearly kills you. And then it's like, you know, and it was, it was a fault of nothing of my own. It was just more of a stupidity and the rule set, right? I mean, it was like, nobody had looked at this simple engineering failure. And, and so, you know, I, I could have been that guy that could have blamed everybody else for the problem where I could have just said, well, you know, I'm glad it happened to me and not somebody else. And that was, a, that's actually been my motto all these years is every day I wake up, I'm glad it happened to me and it didn't happen to somebody else. I don't ever want it to be anybody else. I don't want anybody else to be the guy that had that happen to them. So, um, you know, you have to get used to walking into walls. Um, it happens. My right shoulder, uh, takes a lot of injuries. You have to, you, you suddenly get used to large crowds will scare you a little bit more than they did before. Um, you don't know that what you're going to be able to do necessarily around law, like kids, um, especially young know, toddlers running around. So you end up moving a lot slower. Um, having two kids has helped. Um, that's why I like big dogs. I don't have small dogs. It's easier for me to spot where they are. And, you know, I can keep track of them, right? So I still live with this world where everything over here is completely gone. I don't ever see it. You know, I may be able to hear it, um, but, you know, I've done plenty of trauma to my ears over the years, being in the army or playing heavy metal music, then my hearing's not as good, right? So I I'm always surprised at how well I can hear. And there's a difference. You learn to become um, a completely different sensory person in, in combat than you are outside of combat. So I would actually say that my senses are way better even with my eyes or eye uh, in terms of, of what I'm dealing with when I'm actually fighting than I am without. So in, I have depth perception when I have my armor on, when I don't have my, hel my helmet on, I, I feel like I don't have any depth perception sometimes. So there's, and that's because of a lot of the training and a lot of the, the road to recovery. But, you know, for some people, that's gonna be a real big issue is that, depending on the level of your trauma, how long is it going to take you mentally to come back? And you have to not, you have to constantly drive uh, forward on that notion. And then when you can get over that hump, then you can also maybe work on both the, the actual physical side. I was lucky in that I had, like I said, I have a really supportive sister, I had a really supportive mom and dad and they really, and a lot of really, really awesome friends that are all part of, um this group and they all really they were there for me as i was coming back so i would say that honestly that it took me two years from the injury to be where i was even remotely able to function on a on a high level so but i i still would say it took 10 altogether before i was fully back and able to completely reprogram my brain like like else we had said every day we wake up and it's just part of who we are and it's um it's a disability i could be you know let it be the debilitation that keeps me from doing everything or i could be the guy most people never even knew it happened so and i like that i'm more the latter instead of the former yeah i kind of miss that one-eyed helmet you used to have yeah i still have the mask i still, <laughs> you know i still have i still have the old one and uh i, I you know it's up in the I think, you know, it's interesting because like that we could talk about is it. like um, that's when I really felt like I re had reprogrammed my brain. I was right eye dominant. You know, anybody who here has been in the army, you find out what do eye dominance you are when you go in. It's a test, right, for when you're starting to learn to shoot. And I'm right eye dominant, always have been. And guess what? I was still right eye dominant after getting hurt. And that's the eye that didn't work, you know. Um, and so imagine where all of a sudden, like you're, you're literally going through the day and your right eye, your brain wants to use a right eye, but the right eye is gone, 
right? So it's always black, pushing the black to your left. And it's always trying to encroach. So it's taken all these years and it wasn't until we made the second Zishagi, the one, the, the, the famous Rose Zishagi that, you know, Johannes and I realized that the vision had moved over, right? So the left eye had taken over that much. Either that or I managed to learn to turn my head enough too, right? I mean, it's probably a combination of all the things. But yeah, it's, that's, that was like a real big sim symbol to me in my head of I had passed the milestone in the recovery. And that was like a decade after, mm -hmm. if not more. I would say 10 years though, like to be safe. I would have to go look at when I got that helmet made and because that was pretty much the clue is when we realized the, the half plate was blinding me. It was actually hindering me more. Now, my Viking helmet does it a lot more than that ever did believe it or not but yeah so okay well and now we're going to uh, go back to uh Donya Perrin so the two biggest changes for me um after having a kid was no longer being able to be an intuitive fighter and no longer just relying on fighting to provide the the physical training I needed to succeed so basically what that looked like was my body no longer was doing what I thought I was telling it to do. And so I had to take a, a step back and let my brain take over. Um, and as Ed was mentioning, brain changes are slow. Um, and so like it, it was a very long process before I actually became better than I was before I had to do that, just fighting instinctually. And the other thing was for me, because I was already hyper flexible, like I had really bad continuous injuries from rolling ankles, pulling my knees, um, like the, the joint laxity was very problematic for me, continued injuries. So I had to stop and be like, okay, like, let's think of myself as an athlete. Uh, let's realize that, you know, fighting is not doing enough for this road to recovery. So what do I need to do? And that's when I started strength training. Um, and, and actually taking this seriously, actually taking sort of like really deliberate steps every day to, to bring myself closer to the goals I've wanted to do. Um, and you know, the, the other thing, the, the breathing issue, um, is I've had to become a lot better at communicating with my training opponents. Um, so like the, I need a minute, I need to catch my breath. Um, but I also have to make some hard choices sometimes. There are going to be events that I know are going to have triggers and I, I'm going to have to make decisions not to fight. Um, or I'm going to have to be really careful. And it's like, if I want to fight at Australia, guess what? I can't camp there. So, you know, having to make decisions to figure out what's the most important thing to me so that I can keep fighting. Um, you know, learning to do breathing exercises, uh, figuring out what my triggers are, avoiding them and, and making the choice to do that. And rabbit. So as I mentioned, I, uh, my accident was um, in 2007. I started fighting in the year 2000. So I was still pretty young. I was, uh, what, 20 something when I got hurt. If there's anything good about my situation is that I was pretty young when it happened. I shattered my, my right arm pretty significantly. But even more, that was kind of the, the mental aspect for me to get through was having my neck broken. Um, I had to wear an apparatus called a halo, if anybody's familiar with it. Um, had to wear one of those for about five and a half months. And um, usually people who have wear the halo, they're you know still able to get around and do things because they have the use of both of their hands. I did not have the use of my hands at the same time of having a halo on. So it was uh, entertaining, to say the least, and trying to figure out. There's definitely things that we look back on and can laugh about it. Um, but as far as recovering from it after the fact, uh, something that uh, Duke Art mentioned was sticking to the, um, the advice and exercises that the doctors give you. Um, the biggest issue that I have that persists now is my wrists and my forearm. Um, so doing those to get to a point where you're able to fight in the first place, even pick up something, a sword or, or whatever, the case, the, whatever the case may be, is very important. But then after the fact, even through today now, in order for me to manage it, I have to very seriously warm up my wrists. And once I get moving, keep moving 
during the fight or during the tournament or whatever. Otherwise, I'll start to get, you know, achy or whatnot. Um, other things that are important, also talking about art, is uh, armoring correctly. So now, if, when I do occasionally fight heavy now, I have to armor my right forearm a whole lot more uh, than I had previously because my forearm is now made of metal. Any amount of real impact on there will be not not physically devastating, but mentally devastating to the point of pain where I just can't fight anymore. So um, for me, very much around paying attention to what the doctor said to get back to a fighting form and then figuring out the new normal um, that you need to follow to stay competitive. And for me, that was making sure I warm up prior and still do keep things moving. And while you want to push your limits, you don't want to break the limits. That's kind of what I've found success in doing is pushing my limits right up to the point of breaking them, but then backing off a little bit. Now, as for me, uh, when I had my, uh, my double hernia surgery back around 2000 ish, um, you know, went to PT and for anybody that's uh, ever had uh, the, the hernia issues, you're not going to walk for about a few days easily. And when you do start walking, it's still painful. And I was stupid. I started, you know, within the third day, I'm trying to do crunches because we know how much core strength is required to throw a good shot. Um, I've got a lot of scar tissue down there because of that. And that is uh, occasionally uncomfortable. Uh, again, didn't listen to the doctors, push myself hard. Eventually, after a couple of months, was uh, decent to go back to fighting. But when it came, uh, when I had the uh, the bone spur removed, I sort of listened then, and I was back fighting within six weeks. But they had to go in laparoscopically, grind the uh, the bone spur down, vacuum it out, clean it up, stitch it back in. And like I said, six weeks I was uh, back fighting with no pain. But going to the uh, shoulder surgery last October. Um, I ex brought in videos to my uh, orthopedist. I brought in videos to my uh, physical therapist, went through, showed them everything that we do, both on the rapier field as well as on the armored field. And they looked at me and was like, okay, you're crazy. That's obvious. Can you bring these things in? So I brought my swords in and showed them what I was going into surgery for and, and how I moved the swords around. Like, okay. Now that I've got a visual and not just watching it on video, we can design a regimen to get your arm back in shape. And they warned me ahead of time, considering your age, we're going to go low and slow. And they took their time with me first starting with, uh, you know, just low repetitive, low weight, increasing to high repetitions, low weight, and then going even further. And then about uh, three months ago, they went from, uh, high rep, low weight to high speed, low weight to get the fast, uh, the fast muscle receptors kicking in again. And that's what I've been working on uh, currently. And like I said, finally, last Wednesday, they said, I'm cleared for everything now. I can be as stupid as I want. Um, but uh, again, this time I actually listened to the whole thing and did everything the right way. So, you know, we'll see when I can finally get to swing a stick or uh, poke somebody how well it goes, but uh, my shoulder feels a lot better than it did when Nader tore me up. I'm blaming him. He was the last person to hit the shoulder, so. The next question we have to go around is, what changes, if any, have we made to our fighting styles to accommodate the recovery? And again, Art, uh, you've been the most recent, and I know you, you gave it a try last weekend. Uh, have you had to make any accommodations for your arm? Well, it's very early in the process for the arm, to be honest. Uh, leading up to this, about, I don't know, how long has it been now since we got together and fought rapier? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been a while. I picked, it, I, I picked up a, a new rapier kit, and to keep myself moving, as soon as the doctor released me for light fencing activity, uh, we spent a lot of time with that. And I'm very right-handed, so I've worked out that arm quite a bit. And I did notice on Sunday that I was having, you know, there's a psychological thing that goes along with this that some of you have mentioned. I don't want to hurt it again. I don't ever want to have my elbow cut open again. That was 
not a pleasant experience. Um, so I was holding back. Every uh, of the other people that I was sparring with, every one of them said consistently that they felt like I was holding back. I'm going to have to get past that. By the end of the day, I felt like I had worked towards that. Um, I have found that I am more comfortable than I expected. And I am I actually started the day just swinging at a shield, through, throwing the three or four shots that are in my basic combat package, if you will, and making sure all of it did its thing without clicking or grinding or pulling. Um, I was gratified that none of that happened. In fact, the, the whole, <laughs> it lasted longer than most of the other people did all day and and having those problems. All I can say is, at this stage, I haven't accommodated it at all. Other than I'm subconsciously not swinging as hard as I can. I'm not looking for the fence. Um, that comes with practice. Uh, I've had friends who've worked with me through their injuries, specifically knee injuries, you know, when we teach them to do lunges. Not because the knee doesn't needs exercise, because by the time you're done with your PT, you are done. You really are as strong as you're gonna get. The but they don't trust the knee. You know, if you're doing lunges on a line, you have no choice but to trust it or land on your ass or face. However that works out. Excuse my language. Um, so I'm trying to find that place that I can do the same thing with my arm. Fair enough. Uh, Elspieta, you had mentioned uh, arthritis. Has that impacted your style at all? You know, not not so much. Actually, you know, it's, it's one of the things I don't really talk about because nobody ever asks me this question. Um, and when I started fighting 20 years ago, I had some initial concerns. <laughs> but the way that I do fight, um, I'm traditionally known as a sword and buckler fighter because I could control protection of this range and I don't fight with a big one I fight with a pretty just a body size buckler um and I've become quite I mean that's what I'm known for I'm quite good at it uh, it's very hard I, I feel like for you to get me in my body it, it, I have to be not paying attention um uh for that and uh, a lot of it has been uh for uh it's been a crutch for me in many cases which I'm now working on getting um, expanding my, my, my repertoire of fighting. I'm not known to be a single combat fighter. And a lot of that is due to the, the arthritic aspect, um, especially in my wrist area. I kind of similar to what rabbit talked about where I'm um, with his, um, accident, he and I are very different. He likes to warm up and go out there. I don't because it's going to take every bit It'll take all that I have from me. I'll eventually run out. Uh, my wrists won't be able to get, give anymore. And also like with attorney fighting, you fight and then you sit and you fight and then you sit and then you fight and then you sit. For me, makes it hard for to keep all of my, uh, my momentum going. Um, and that's some things I'm working on myself as well. Uh, you know, some of those um, constant recovery pieces on how to be a better fighter. My fighting style, I've leaned on that, that sword and buckler. I'm very good at protecting this side. And I don't feel like I need to protect it. Um, but yet subconsciously, it's a, it's a subconscious. Um, what, you know, it's a lot of fighting. A lot of things are mental. And we don't realize that those mental pieces are there. And, and, um, and I definitely know, you know, know that that's a lot of part of it. It's, I feel safer helps me with my aggression um, on the field, helps me feel more comfortable. Um, one of the pieces also, I worked on trying to build my wrist. I have tiny little wrists and, and that's where a lot of my arthritis sits. I can't fight with long swords. In rapier, there's a lot of people who have various lengths. I fight with probably the shortest sword you, you, know, uh, you can because that's where my comfort zone is. I mean, we've got some six foot three tall beasts that fight with case of 42s. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be faster than they are. I'm going to be more aggressive than they are. Um, I'm not going to let them intimidate me, um, which is what they use a lot of that size and stuff for. So, and I use my buckler to also that advantage where I can get in on them if I need to. Um, I know we can't charge in rapier like the way you can in heavy, um, but it doesn't mean I can't be aggressive and I can't um, stand my ground and, and not let them run me over. You know, like Art said, getting over being worried about being hurt. That's what's going to hold me back a lot, especially after I have a new surgery um, and I have a new pacemaker and I have new scar tissue 
you know, you talked about your hernia and the scar tissue. That's true. I have lots of, I have 30 years of scar tissue and they cut out some and they put in more and, and it's all new and I'm, you know, and then I have to get used to it. So in this current one, I've been more worried about being hurt because of the placement of it. Um, and that was a big psychological thing I had to get over with my fighting. Rabbit. The biggest uh, thing that I had to change after getting hurt was I just had to change my focus uh, from from heavy to rapier is what I did. Um, so I when I got back to fighting form where I was able to put stuff on and I was able to fight, I can I was able to get out there and play. But as anybody who's fought heavy know, you can never guarantee that you're not going to get hit somewhere. And with me being a still a rather new fighter uh, in the heavy realm, I was getting hit in my forearm quite a bit. And it's with, with however much arm armor or whatever, even with the padding and everything like that, any amount of impact was really just killing it. So uh, made the conscious decision to later, actually much later, to change my target of progression in the SA from heavy to rapier. Um, I still enjoy going out and, you know, throwing spear on the heavy field. Um, it worked out well for me because there's not, there's very rarely a direct impact to your arm in when you're, when you're playing spear in melee. So I feel comfortable enough doing that. Um, with, um, challenges that I've had to change once I've gotten going in rapier was, um, try again, making sure that I kept warm. Cause I found if I stopped fighting or I slowed down, then my wrists would start to throb and get going and whatnot. So I had to, I had to keep going. I had to keep the activity up. So that's why a lot of times during uh, a lot of our important tournaments, you're, you're generally not going to see me sitting down somewhere. I'm going to have my swords in my hand. I'm going to keep going, you know, moving around so that I keep the blood flowing and it stays, you know, I stay good. So yeah, as far as changing my, my anything because of my, uh, injury was changing my focus from from heavy to rapier okay thank you you know for me uh, the mental game was probably the most since and, and everybody's already mentioned uh what's happened in their mental game i know that being a florentine fighter on the heavy field and having a hernia a you know, double hernia right below the belly button and recovering from that surgery i was extremely paranoid about thrusts to that region uh possibly tearing and reopening the uh, hernia surgery so I, you know, for a while I actually fought with a shield. Not very well, I might add, but you know, I, being very paranoid about getting hit, I would rather I, I was not worried about a cup shot. I was just worried about just above that, and uh, you know, it, it showed in my fighting, and it took me a while to get my brain wrapped around the fact that you know, increased training and and whatnot. And then currently with the shoulder, I've been doing some very light pell work, and I've actually been working uh, a little bit with Perrin. Uh, we've been discussing uh, body biomechanics on how to throw shots and retooling how to throw a wrap shot with either arm to get the most power bang for the buck with the least amount of impact on the elbow and shoulder while throwing it. And you know, little things you don't think about uh, build up into one big effect for the final blow impact. So um, that's been my big key thing right now is retooling my mental body mechanics on on how to work effectively without causing more trauma to the body to get the same thing done. So, um, and that was actually one of the uh, the questions on the side over here. I think it was Merrick. Um, let's see. What tools did you use to manage uh, the mental hurdles uh, in recovery? I know, Ed, you briefly touched on that. Is there anything else you want to cover on the, the, the mental side of things? Yeah, that, it was hard. I mean, um, I think, you know, even a couple decades, you know, since it's still five days, of just it's a, it's a struggle, you know, like, uh, pouring coffee is a challenge you never experienced, thought you'd experience, you know, and, uh, you, you learn to stick your finger in things when you fill it up, 
you know, in the dark, you know, like, and you, you learn to get, uh, you have a, you have an index finger that's a high, has a high tolerance for heat, you know, I guess, and things like that. You like, you learn some really interesting uh, ways, especially at an SEA event when the dark, when there's hardly any light and you want beer, right? So uh, you learn ways to, to not overfill your mug, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but it, it was really hard and, and Elsbeta, she saw it firsthand um, over for the years because like that trauma for a year or two or even three, um, it was really tough. Uh, I, I explored a lot of different things. So I, being a martial artist, I mean, and I dove heavily back into martial arts. Um, I sought out Augustine Fong, who's here in Tucson and, and went in and did some training with him over in, in his Kung Fu stuff. And, I studied some, a lot of meditation for me. Also, one of the things that I really got, I went back into something I was really, that I was able to do really heavily as a kid. And I've always been a bit, as I'm a, I'm a deep listener when it comes to music. So a lot of my meditation is in the, when I do deep listening. So I may put on an al an album that I want to listen to with just headphones or whatever, and, and lay down and just listen to that, that, that music. And that's allows me to get, through a lot of things so and, and the other thing that's really strange is it's hard hard labor so if i'm not talking to anybody it's just me it's myself in my head out on a hike or i'm in the yard doing what i call yardio or i'm lifting really 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 heavy weights it's just me and it's my battle with uh with myself against something else right um and i can at that point go through all that stuff Right. I can't, I don't have anybody to verbalize it with. I don't have anybody interjecting their thoughts or their comments into what I'm doing. It allows me to just kind of meditate through those issues. Um, and for me, that, that's been the, a constant, even now to at this day, like, you know, I'm still going to go lift really heavy. And that's the thing that's going to be kind of drifting in my head when I'm doing that stuff. So everybody's a little different with it though. I mean, I tried a lot of different things. I've tried, you know, zazen meditation. I've tried yoga uh, because people would say that's a great way, and I was like, that's just a stupid way to fall down. Um, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of, of things in that way. But I had to also spend a lot of time because I was so unsure of myself now in my own visual acuity. And so I had to spend so much mental time training that, right? And it was so it was, it was it as simple as like, I am going to stand in front of a mirror and learn how my body feels because I can't see it. And that was, uh, and, and when we were talking a bit ago, like what did I have to do, you know, what kind of things did we have to do to change our fighting style? Right. I had to learn to f just recognize the feel. So maybe it helped me learn to be an elevated fighter in that regard, because I had to switch to what we all talk about. You have to do. I had to just do it to survive. Like I had to learn that I had to feel it and just trust that it was there. Right. I had to know like there's a guy, Sir Roger, told me long ago when I was first learning to fight sword and shield. And he was like, you have to just know that that shot is there because you can't see it, right? You're blind in that eye that everybody else can see it with. So you just have to know it's there. And that became a lot of my, my mental training was just, I had to, to rep out so many times to be able to just trust that I knew it was the thing, right? And it's by creating that, repetition i create that trust in myself mm -hmm. right ask elsbieta who's a better fighter or, or i know there's been other people i've asked instead of knowing me before i was hurt and after and the same amount of time the guy who was hurt is the better fighter because he tries harder he trains more he does more things than the guy who just had the skills to just do it because he had two eyes and he could just rely on that. He could rely on his speed and his quickness. And that's so, I mean, I had to learn about measure and staying in measure. And that's why when I'm in, when I have you in my measure, I want, that's it. You're it. I'm going to keep you there. Right. And it's, if you've ever wrestled a completely blind wrestler, once they get a hold of you, they don't ever let go. Right. And it's the same thing 
with me. I just took on that. So I learned a lot of those things. I remember mentally thinking, oh, I can't do this. I'm a failure. I'm never going to be able to do it. This is just too hard. How, how can I? And I remember seeing a, an interview with Michael Jordan. And regardless of who or what you think of him as a person, um, he's arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. And he was talking in an interview. Somebody said to him, why are you so great? And his response wasn't, why? It wasn't like, ah, I'm so great. It was literally him listing out all the times he failed. Every time he failed. And he said, I just fail more than everybody else. That's why I'm here. And I remember thinking, ah, that's it. So just go fail a lot, Ed. Just go fail. And that was it. That was like the mental thing for me. And it's just like always being willing to fail physically at it and learning that I can learn something from that, right? There's no true loss. It's a failure that I can learn from. And that's everything about my methodology since then. And that was the thing I had to learn to get back over it. Art, same question. I'm sure they went on a while. Was a question again? <laughs> Uh, we're discussing the, the mental hurdles of getting back into fighting. You briefly touched on, uh, you know, not swinging for the, uh, for the trees anymore. Um, items of that nature. So have there been any other, uh, mental hurdles you've had to work with? First and foremost was I have never had a surgery of any kind prior to the elbow. So if you were around me for about a month before that surgery was scheduled, you would have noticed that I was a bit freaked out about it. Never been under general anesthetic. You know, heard terrible things about it. I'm allergic to painkillers. Can't take any kind of an opiate. This makes the idea of being cut open and stitched back together a little frightening. Uh, ultimately, you just have to suck it up. And I know that that's not the answer these days. But truthfully, that's how I managed to get to the hospital in the first place to get that done. And then afterwards... Um, I have this, I'm one of those people that, you know, if you have an itch, you scratch it. If something hurts, you poke it to see if it still hurts. So I just kept poking at the edges of it. You know, something as simple as bring a towel back and forth across your back was telling me that I needed to not do anything to that elbow. So every day I take a shower when I'm drying myself off and I'm realizing, oh, you know, that's not as bad as it was yesterday. I need to pay attention to this. Everything is back to normal. Now all I have to do is make sure my armor is good so this never happens again. <laughs> <laughs> I switched out those. It was a bad pad. And I switched out those pads the day after it happened. <laughs> okay. um, maintain your stuff. That's important. More important than I realized, obviously. I eased into it. I fought rapier back in the Dark Ages before there were even rules. And so I felt that was a good avenue. If you get some exercise, if you use the arm, it was taking no risks at all. I wore an elbow pad with an aluminum cop on it while I was doing that. And later I dropped the one with the elbow with the, with the cop on it. And now if I fight right here, I don't need it anymore because I'm comfortable. I've been stabbed. I've been hacked at it. And it's like, okay, the scar tissue sucks if he gets hit. That's not good at all. But it didn't. Basically, I'm poking that wound every time I use my arm to make sure that it's good. My only advice to anyone who has a major injury is if you're going to gain confidence in it, you just have to, now I'm not saying push it, don't break it, but test it every opportunity. That's where you're going to realize, okay, it's not so bad anymore. It's getting better. It's stronger. Um, doctor says my arm is a, is 90%. And since I'm not a workout junkie, I figure if I actually start working harder at it, I can get past where I was before I had the surgery. That's my mental game I play with myself. I'm not going to make it better than the doctor says it can be. I'm going to make it better than it was. Donya Perrin, since you answered, yes, you. Uh, so like 10% of women after giving birth, I had postpartum depression. And so here you are wanting to get back at this thing you love, but you're not getting the reward, because mental reward, because your performance is 
way below where it ought to be. And you're also dealing with all of the lifestyle changes. You're dealing with um, all of these additional challenges for just your energy. And you're having to allocate it to really small things like knitting your pelvis back together. And so being able to to get over that mentally, I really needed two things. Uh, one was touched on, and that was celebrating the really small victories. Um, and drilling really helped with that, breaking it down into basics, getting small measurable things that I could see improvements on, uh, strength training, um, form things, that sort of thing. So basically creating a paradigm so that you can monitor your progress. Um, and the other thing I really needed was support from the community. So here I am wondering if I still belong because, you know, I've got all this body dysmorphia. I've got all of these, these struggles that I'm trying to like work through physically. And what I needed was a support from my spouse, support from a good sports bra, and support from the community saying, I still mattered, I still belonged, even if I wasn't taking the field that day. And so that's what helped get me through it. Um, and also, you know, when you are dealing with mental things, if it reaches the point where, uh, you know, therapy or, or medical help uh, is there to help. So, you know, don't, you don't have to just sort of tough it up. Uh, there are resources and there's no shame in that. And uh, Elspieta. I would kind of concur with Donia Parent. I was going to mention the same thing with mental setbacks. Um, the biggest setback I had actually had to do with after my, when I was pregnant is I had also really severe postpartum depression. Um, and unfortunately, I think more than 10% have it. We just don't talk about it. Um, but it was pretty bad. Um, my poor husband, uh, <laughs> uh, and it was longer than, um, just a few months. It, it per persisted for almost two years. Um, and, um, it really hit in the aspect of me that not feeling, um, good enough, um, just because everything was so different and you are not the person you were before having everything changes so drastically. And, and um, so it took a long, it was a long haul. And one of the, the, the biggest things that I, you know, for me to help um, move past it is, is I had to stop caring, um, you know, and it was, uh, I, I hearken back and my brother will know exactly what I'm talking about. And I have to use proper words, but um, I, I went to Comic-Con with my brother when I was pregnant and he and I went to go see Will Wheaton. And Will Wheaton talked about having his drawer of fracks empty and having no more fracks to give. Um, and I have recent, that's been kind of the biggest in, in getting back into, um, a better mental state. Um, I am, I dumped that drawer out. I don't give any fracks anymore. It doesn't exist. I cleaned it out and it's, you know, it's like trying to, to get over what other people perceive of me. Um, that's what was preventing me from getting, from feeling better about myself, from not caring about, you know, and also just not worrying about how I was doing being as a fighter. If I needed to work through an issue after a surgery and I, because after a surgery, I'm going to dip in how I'm doing, you know, well, I'm, you know, especially now that, you know, I became a white scarf while I was pregnant. Talk about fear coming back on, you know, you coming back and just like parents talking about everything is different. The way you fight, the way you move your body, your hips, even not even the right spot. None of your armor fits. And that, you know, and I was given that, that award and then I had to go back out and felt like I had to prove myself. Um, that was tough. Uh, and once now I, I've at the point, I was like, no, I don't have to prove myself. I just have to continue to get better for me so I can get better for my students. So I can continue to have fun because ultimately that's really what it came down to is, is that I love fighting. I love doing these things. And, and, and if I'm so worried about being perfect and being the best, it's going to take away my love. Um, and that's not what I started playing when I was a teenager. I started playing because it was fun and I got to mess around with my brother and we got to hit people with sticks and I got to do things that, you know, not, I get to dress up in fun clothes, you know, it was fun. Um, and so it, it's really, it's a constant work through of that, um, that piece. So I thank you, Perrin, for bringing that up. I, you know, it's one of those pieces that I think was we as women fighters also don't talk about a lot. And, and I think also just fighters in general. I mean, as we a mental being aware that all of us are going through mental challenges, some greater than others, and being willing to talk about it and admit it's there and not having stigma about it 
that's where we're all going to be better. And anyone, when they have recovery, they have an injury, no matter what it is, um, they can move um, forward um, in a path that, that suits them best. So that's my soapbox about the mental stuff. For those that are parents, how has that changed uh, how you manage your students and your teaching? Well, I was a teacher before I was a mom. Um, so I've been dealing with, I mean, I've been an educator and I'm going on my 20, uh, first year of being a teacher of high school students. So I won't say it necessarily changed much other than it made me more patient. Um, I, I noticed that once I became a parent, I became more patient even with my own students in my real world, as well as with my students um, that I have. Um, some of them who are older than me, you know, and, and uh, um, but I think that um, speaks to that piece. And I think I think my brother would attest to that. Anybody who's had, uh, you know, and parent probably it's that patience piece where, they, you know, there's a little more, a little more time. So I would say I stopped making assumptions about what somebody knew before they arrived. Um, I started thinking a lot more about how we develop skills. Uh, so a, top, a topic that I've been very passionate about lately is pre-skills. So what is it that we pick up just rough and tumble during childhood um, that some people get and some people don't? And so being able to see somebody when they take the field for the very first time and go, okay, they don't know how to hit somebody. They've never had to to work through that and being able to take several, several steps back and help them, you know, in a way that's appropriate for them. Um, I would also say my feedback has gotten a lot more specific and positive. And by positive, I mean, rather than saying don't, do. Um, so it's like, okay, what I, instead of the, well, don't get hit there, um, it's going to be the, okay, so what's happening is you're doing this, it's leaving this opening. Um, so what you're going to do is, is maintain it like this. And when you need to move, use these muscles in this way and showing the difference. So basically creating actionable, specific, positive feedback um, and pre-skills. The, the mental game is, is the biggest thing in, in a lot of situations that we deal with. How do you counsel your dependents or students or aspirants through injury? Like, how do you make sure that they don't feel this kind of internal stress? And I didn't type this all out, but how do you make sure they don't feel the internal stress of trying to achieve more and basically do more damage to themselves in the process? Um, Yonka had a really great response, but, you know, I was just curious as, you know, all peers, how you've helped people through those processes. Well, Rabbit who was on our panel, he had to leave. He's actually one of, he's my student. Um, and he, and he, and I've known him since that, well, but even before his car, his, uh, motorcycle accident. So he and I have gone back a very long way. Um, and so, um, uh, knowing his passion to excel, he's very competitive and he's very much like me in that. Um, I, I just helped to, to temper him and to encourage him in a way that, that, um, reminds him that it's okay to have limits. It's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to hurt. Uh, it's okay to sit one out. Um, it's, it's okay. Like when he struggled with the transition from, cause he was also my husband's squire before becoming uh, my student um, for rapier, um, making that transition. I wanted to make sure that, you know, he, it wasn't, he, he wasn't anything. It wasn't anything lesser. He's still being an active fighter. He's doing what, what his heart, speaks to him and when he wants to go fight um heavy on the rapier field and go do um uh spear and he feels that that he's he wants to do that, i encourage that um because that if it, especially if his his arms and his body is is telling him to go do that he's listening like art spent said he's listening to himself um and that's the biggest piece that i encourage for all of my students because i have a wide range of of age groups is i is listen to yourself don't push yourself if you're going, because then if you're, in, you don't want to end up hurting yourself to the point where you can't continue um, to do what you're going to do. So that's my perspective. Many of you may know my Squire Bear. A year ago, May, he got a infection in his leg, which he did not immediately recognize as MRSA. We almost lost it. He has had his armor on a couple of times since then. He is not fully recovered. Um, part of this is because he's a big man. 
and he, he has the health issues to go with that. But he and I talk every week. Um, my opening question every time is, how are we doing? Where are we with weight? How's that leg? How's the swelling? And like Elzbieta said, absolutely making it understood that it is there's nothing wrong with taking the time to heal. If you don't get that from your teacher and from those people around you, his brother squires, you may force yourself to do something that could cause you an injury. I mean, with the heat right now up here, and I mean, he's feeling fine. Um, he's not making excuses. I won't let him put his arm around. He collapsed. We couldn't even get him off the hill. <laughs> Um, but he knows that. He, in fact, right before this started, he and I had a chat about that very subject. Um, you really have to, if you're going to be responsible for helping a person get to a, where their goals are in the SEA, or just be a friend, really, you got to stay with that person. You got to make sure that they're thinking about their injury, poking, poking the bruise. How was it today? compared to yesterday, right? Um, all of my squires are in my age group and all of them have, have suffered injuries and we have all sat down together around the campfire and done what old men do and talk about, you know, our medications and our, <laughs> our wounds uh, and how we healed and how we've moved on. Communication is everything. Again, as we had a round right of the money there, there, if you aren't, Staying with your student and making sure they understand that what they're doing is either the right thing or the wrong thing, depending on what they're trying to do, you're going to lose them. You're not going to get the chance. So I had advice for a teacher, for a student, when the injury came in, is stay with that person like you would your child. Make sure they're going to the doctor. Make sure they're not ignoring it or pushing themselves too hard. We have a follow-up on that from Valora of how do we alleviate the pressure from others uh, that are taking the time to heal, basically for your students? Yes, Ed? Uh, remember what Elzbeta was talking about? Yep. Uh, you have to empty your, your drawer of Fs to get Yes, but how do, you, how do you help your students empty their drawers? Yeah, you, you, you tell them. <laughs> I mean, you, you do. You just tell them to, or if you do it for them, if, if anything. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what art's doing with bear yep. i mean it's it's awesome and uh, elspeda's doing rabbit and it, that's what you have to do you, and, and we as friends for each other i mean that's the the best part about the sca is we're all friends as well as mentors to people as they are on their path we're the uh, our job as peers to someone that's on the path is to help guide them on the path it's our job to say listen don't listen to what they said i I used to do this with Dom all the time and just tell, I would say to him, listen, you do things in the timeline that we have put it, we're going to do it at your, your level, your, you, you know, that you can do it and don't worry about what they're telling you to do. Um, and that's the same thing with injury, right? And there's a difference between being hurt and being injured. And when it's an injury, you have to come back in the right way. And you, and if you have an experience on it, if you're their peer, don't push them too fast. And it's our job to help them. And helping them empty their, their Fs to give drawer is one of those things. And I, I, I commend Art for what he's doing with Bear. And, you know, that's just – that's a great analogy of how to do it. Like you poke, poke the bruise, right? But that's our job as their peer. That's not other people's jobs. And you strict that out to them and say, listen, I've had those injuries. I know what it's like to come back too soon. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. And, and you just protect them uh, in terms of – you say, listen, if somebody wants to talk to you, just say, okay, man, I really appreciate that. I'm doing what uh, my peer is telling me to do right now. And you become the bubble of protection, like you're that sphere of a big, you know, like a big rib neck brace or something, right, for them. And I think that's the best way to handle it. Um, I've done it with some of my guys, and, and I'll continue to be doing that. You know, I do it with even people who aren't kind of, you know, it's just like, you know, if you need somebody to 
to, to, to fade the heat, I guess, is the way we say it. And that's the way you do it. Two of my official students um, are out with long-term injuries right now. And uh, as Art mentions, like you maintain that relationship not through the SCA at that point in time. So it's like you check in with them as their friend. Um, and also, like, let them know that you are more important than your fighting. Like, I care about you, not what it looks like, when or if or how you recover. Um, and I think that's that's really important. And, you know, for people that are, you know, not necessarily in that relationship, I'm really careful about how I talk to them when I encounter them. So, like, I want to make sure that they're still part of the community. So, you know, maybe you're not fighting right now, but maybe I can support you in a, in a role where you talk to new people, where I get you teaching, um, where I get you at least hanging out like, hey, you know, why don't you come on and join this conversation? Be really deliberate about that. Um, and, you know, when uh, the heat is turned on, like, where is this person? It's been a long time. Why don't you see how they're doing? Why don't you check in on them? Why don't you say hi? I you know, and, and um, addressing some questions and dealing with some heat so that they don't have to, because that's how I support you. Uh, we got one last question that was uh, brought up and uh, it was from the Middle Kingdom. And they've got a, a, a number of people switching from uh, heavy to rattan or from uh, heavy to rapier with their mental concept of it's gonna be easier on the body. And they wanted to get that opinion and since just about everybody on this panel has fenced and a number of us have tried heavy. Um, my personal take is it's a different set of biomechanics. It's not easier, it's different. Um, it's still difficult. So anybody else wanna put their two bits in? Ed, you're shaking your head. I, I completely agree with you. If anything, I mean, uh, it's just a different group of muscle. It, I mean, there's just different muscles. I mean, maybe you have to have a stronger neck for hard suit to because you know i mean that, that's because we wear heavy helmets that's that's i mean that's like it i mean the, the armor is a little heavier so maybe you know maybe your back could be a little stronger but i don't know i i guess there's some tr there's some tricep muscles that need to be involved more in in hearts but i i just don't i don't buy it i've had just as much i've had maybe heavy more cardio it, 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 they're both anaerobic that neither of them are aerobic workouts, right? They're both anaerobic. They're going to both blow you up. It's going to depend on the, the fighting. You know, you, you, both of them are, are going to destroy you physically at the same, it, it, based on your effort. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a fallacy. I, I laugh every time I hear it. Well, it's why I, so I, many rapier fighters can come over to hard suit and fight rapiers or fight spears so well. It, it's because it's the same. There's no difference. It's just the difference is range, right? Instead of like 42 inches, it's nine feet. And, and and so I I don't know. I agree with with Ed on the aspect of like the physicality. I mean, there's still going to be a level of physicality. There's still um, that piece. Um, uh, but I, I can tell you, Craven, who fights both um, heavy and and uh, rapier, his bruises when he comes home are very different depending on what he's fighting that day. Um, and so I, you know that's the biggest thing there, and that's part of the reason like I gravitated with my my pacemaker. Um, it's not that I'm worried about getting hurt. Um, like, I think I could going and fighting spear would be phenomenal. And I've, I've contemplated it in my brain, but it's the, it's that, that piece of like, well, I would feel absolutely horrible if I did, because the person that hit me and broke me and broke my pacemaker into pieces by a beautiful shot to the shoulder where it's at, they, you know, matter how, and I could armor the heck out of it. But there's always the the aspect of of, uh, of an injury, and so um, that's why I don't gravitate. I love to watch it and study it and talk about it with my husband and my friends. But that's why I stay on the sidelines and I fight rapier. I I can still get that intensity and that joy um, out of it um, because of that. Because it's just that aspect. Of, I I would feel so guilty for that person that that, and they you know I knowing that they would feel awful that they sent me to the hospital. <laughs> Having uh, done armored combat in the past and started doing HEMA, uh, longsword, so there's definitely a lot of respect I have for the 
uh, recovery process and way you use your body to absorb impact that is different for those types of forms um, that you don't really have to deal with in rapier, as well as the amount of power generation you have to do from your uh, pelvic girdle, small muscles of your back, hips, those sorts of things. A lot of respect for the amount of energy you're uh, doing just sort of like creating a stable core for that power generation. Uh, maybe that's a smaller fighter thing. But yes, it is It is rough on your body in those two ways that rapier just can't even touch. Edward, I know this is going to be a surprise to you, but I disagree. <laughs> it's a touch sport. It is easier on the body. It is not easier as a workout. I mean, when I, when I first got released to fight rapier by my doctor, I had some guests at practice. I won't use any names because half of them are here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the next day it felt like I had done leg day, like I hadn't touched, hadn't done leg day in a year. It was rough. However, I was, I never felt like I was going to get hurt. And the result, although there were, cause I didn't wear any, it was it's not an official practice. So I wasn't wearing any body armor. I did have a, a dozen little round bruises on me, which I deserved for my lack of skill. Um, it's a different workout. It is very useful when you can't fight hard suit for whatever reason to keep you moving. Um, I'm going to go off subject just a little bit in the last couple of minutes here. As you get older, if you don't keep moving, you will calcify. You will coagulate, if you will. You will not be able to continue. I know many fighters who were in the generation before me who decided to pick up their armor again because they, they came out and saw us doing the thing. And they were like, wow, that just looks like so much fun. Why am I not still doing this? And it was a hard road to come back. Um, I am among the oldest people in our kingdom that are still fighting regularly. And um, I thank you, D uh, Domingo, for <laughs> in that class of cutting edge fighters. I'm not sure that I'm still there. But Ultimately, if I have any success at this stage, it's because I never took a break longer than I absolutely had to. It's, it's important. And if you can use another form to keep moving, to stay limber, to keep your cardio up, to be able to breathe and to handle the heat, because, you know, here in the desert, it's, you know, being even fighting light weapons of any form, it's a factor you will not regret it. 